everyone, and welcome to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising and Marketing Manager, and I'm your host today. Today's Textile and Tea is sponsored by the Michigan League of Hand Weavers. Learn more about this wonderful guild at their website, mlhguild.org. We will take questions today, as always, but it's the last 15 minutes of the program. Please put them in the Q&A. Um, we love your comments in the chat, but I need to have the Q&A or I won't see the questions. Today, we have Dawn Edwards. Dawn is a felt artist and based in Plainwell, Michigan. She sells her work under the label Felt So Right and teaches extensively within the U.S. and internationally. Her art has appeared in numerous exhibits, shows, magazines, book, including Ellen Baker's book, Worldwide Colors of Felt, um, several issues of the Australian Felt Magazine, the International Felt Makers Association, Felt Matters Journal, um, HGA, Shuttle Spindle and Die Pod, the Russian magazine Felt Fashion, and most recently, several of Don's beaded felt hats have appeared in the International Felt Makers exhibit reconnect. Hi, Don. We are Hi. so excited to have you here today. Well, thank you so much for having me. And um, I thank the MLH also for sponsoring this edition of Textiles and Tea. Um, I'm actually going to be teaching for them this summer in Holland, Michigan. So this is uh, double joy for me. Oh, good. They were so excited to, to uh, sponsor you. It was, it was They're a perfect. wonderful group. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again. Oh, sure. Um, we always start off with the essential question, which is, what is your favorite tea? Well, today I'm drinking a peach chamomile mixture. It's, um, I thought, well, that would be good. It's actually got little bits of peach in it. And I picked it up at a, um, at a little shop in Kalamazoo. So I'm not sure what the brand is, but it's really nice. Oh, good. And then can I show you my mug that I'm drinking from? This is a friend Ooh. of mine. Um, Susan McHenry, who is here in Kalamazoo, and she makes these gorgeous mugs. So it always makes whatever I'm drinking a, a pleasure. <laughs> That's gorgeous. That's beautiful. It, Thanks oh, for sharing that. We you're love that. Welcome. Well, um, if you would just kind of share with us how you got started in fibers. Sure. It was actually quite um, serendipitous. A friend of mine, um, actually one of my very dearest friends, um, Peggy Thompson, um, had seen an advertisement for a needle felted, I think it was a flowers class, if I remember right. It was about 2005. Um, and the shop's not still open, but it was um, just something that we had planned to do as a fun play date. And so we went over to this shop and I was immediately drawn to those fluffy wool fibers and the beautiful bright colors. And um, so we took the class and from there, it was just uh, an immediate love and an obsession. My friend Peggy would call me on the phone and she'd say, what are you doing? And she could hear me, you know, when you're doing that needle felting, it's kind of a chink, chink, chink sound. And she'd say, oh, never mind. I know what you're doing. So. <laughs> Um, but um, from, from that point on, I just did a lot of playing and um, took classes when, um, you know, workshops would become available. I found a class in Kalamazoo at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts that was being taught by Ann Arbor fiber artist. Um, many of you are probably familiar with her. Her name's Loretta Oliver and very kind, patient person. She um, was teaching a class and I don't think that um, in the description of the class that it even used the wording Nuno felting because it was such a new term at the time, but that's basically what it was. We were taking wool and integrating, um, you know, tiny bits of wool um, with silk fabric and creating new fabric. And so this really opened up, you know, a whole new appreciation for felt making, um, you know, just a whole nother realm to the, you know, to the felting experience for me. And um, then 
not long after that, I saw an advertisement for a week-long workshop that was being held over by Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I already uh, knew of Chad Alice Hagen um, because I had read her Habs book. And so she was going to be one of the instructors and then another of my felt idols, um, still a dear friend of mine, Alice Vermeulen from the Netherlands was going to be teaching there. So I asked my husband, do you mind if I go for this you know, week long felting adventure? And um, he said, you know, have at it. And off I went. And I tell you, that was just the best um, experience, you know, for me and my felting career. Oh, that's amazing. I just saw um, Chad Alice this weekend. Oh, she did at, you? Yeah, she was at the Southeast Animal Fiber Festival in Asheville, oh. North Carolina. She is more fun and she's an excellent instructor. And I can't thank um, she or Alice enough for, you know, really um, being mentors and, um, you know, my idols. Um, and, and I still think the world of both of them. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. So <clears throat> what do you think for you? Um, is the influence or the cause or whatever that guided you from doing the flat, you know, scarves mm -hmm. and eventually you were producing these, um, I mean, I hate to call them a hat because they were more like sculptures. It's like you, mm -hmm. you made this beautiful wearable art. So how did it go from just something so simple to something so incredible? Well, I, I think I probably got a lot of different answers to that question and probably any artist that you ask um, about in the business. Um, so rein me back in if I get off track, but um, I think first, um, just as I was saying, um, taking workshops um, from a lot of different instructors and um, finding that they all teach differently and have different methods um, you can accomplish you know, many of the same things um, by, you know, using entirely different um, techniques. For one example, um, that workshop that I was just telling you about, um, Chad would come by and I was relatively new at felting then. And she would come by and she would say, more water, Dawn, more water. Water is your friend. <laughs> And so, um, you know, I, I had lots of water. And then with Alice from the Netherlands, they don't use as much water in the felting. And so, uh, you know, I was making, I think I was making a bag or a hat or something at the time. And she'd come by and, and say, too much water, Dawn, too much water. And so, you know, what I learned um, from that one is, um, you know, that in probably anything that you're doing in life, there are a number of different ways to accomplish the um, same thing. And, um, and so that, you know, that was really good for me. And I just loved their um, different teaching styles and how they complemented one another at the same time, though. Um, so um, I've taken workshops with, um, if you don't mind me dropping <laughs> a few names, because I think they're all so wonderful. And they really, um, you know, helped me in, in my journey. Um, but there was uh, Mario Line Delinga from Canada, wonderful instructor, if you're a felt maker and ever get a chance to take a workshop with her. Um, Anna Gunnestoder from um, Iceland, Judith Pox from Hungary, Martin Van Zylen and Catherine O'Leary from Australia, Irit Dolman from Israel, and the list goes on and on, but I have just learned so much from each and every one of them. Oh, and I must mention my um, dear friend, we call each other twins, um, Nicola Brown from Ireland, <laughs> and she's actually um, the co-administrator with, um, with me for Felt United. And so um, I just, you know, I've had a, a lot of influences um, from people, um, but um, also just, um, you know, just the way that I process things like most artists, um, I think, you know, it's just a, a gift to look at things, um, you know, in um, different ways um, and create. And I can remember um, way, way back. So this would have been 
2011, and I had been asked to join the Signature Artist Cooperative in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And at the time, um, two friends of mine, felt makers, um, Joni Cornell from Australia, and um, um, another another friend from um, the Carolinas. Um, we're staying here at the house because we were going to this felt workshop together. And so um, Joni was just trying to help me process my um, thoughts and, you know, for questions that might come up in this um, jurying process. And she said, so, you know, do you sketch out your ideas or, you know, how do you work? And I said, no, I can't draw it. You know, I just process it all in my mind, I guess. And, um, and so she said, oh, so you intuit your designs. And I thought, well, what a wonderful, you know, what a wonderful word and a way of looking at things. Um, because I had just always thought I can't draw. And she had looked at it and turned it around and said, you intuit that. So I thought, you know, that was, that was, um, you know, a pretty cool moment, and I, and I still remember that to this day. Well, that's one of the things I want to talk about some later on is, is your design process, so mm -hmm. we'll explore more of that to it sort of thing. Uh-huh, yep. Um, but your work, um, it also can be like on a continuum as far as the 3D to 1D, Mm -hmm. whether you, your one-dimensional beautiful shells and scarves and then always up to your incredible artwork so do you find that um you prefer doing one over the other how do you decide which way you're going to go right um well i like all forms of felting and so so i've given pretty much everything a try um and I, I love Nuno felting. I think um, that was, <laughs> the wrap is Nuno felted again. That's just um, integrating um, your wool and uh, open weave fabric, such as a lightweight silk or a um, cotton gauze. Um, and so to me, that's an amazing um, process because I don't know how the um, person who discovered that technique, her name is Polly Sterling, and she used to live here in the U.S., and she's um, a member of a family that does, you know, a lot of um, felting and probably fiber arts in general, but um, how she ever discovered that, um, you know, doing a slower method of felting, as if felting wasn't slow enough, but even slowing the process down more so by using cool water instead of um, hot water as we typically would use. Um, she found that, you know, by really slowing the process down using um, cool water, that she was able to merge these two, you know, these two different fibers um, and fabric. And so, um, to me, that's just amazing, you know, that that you can um, that you can make Nuno felt. And so I love that, you know, I love that aspect of scarf making. But if I had to choose just one um, aspect of felting, I love sculptural felting. I um, years and years ago, I took um, pottery classes. Um, while I was working at the Kalamazoo Gazette, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts was just right down the road. And so I would go down on my lunch hour, um, throw pots, <laughs> you know, pinch pots and go back with muddy hands. Um, but the sculpting of felt reminds me in many ways, um, you know, of um, making pottery. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just love that. I love that I can take these loose, fluffy fibers and um, you know, through manipulating those um, fibers, that I can actually shape and sculpt them. Um, so that's um, if if just given you know the opportunity to um, create one type of felt, that would be that would be my um, chosen. Well, Lou, you yeah. were talking some about the design process. Mm -hmm. Is your design process different for a flat piece versus a sculpture? Or do you just kind of start and see where the process takes you? I yeah. mean, do you like books where you do, you have your colors or images and that kind of thing? Um, no, I don't, I don't think my mind works like that. I wish it did. Um, but um, for the 
a piece, and I think you've got a photo of that, but it's the felt crown and the, and the wrap. And so um, for that particular piece, I had gone to see, um, so this is how my mind works, but I had gone to see the movie Black Swan with Natalie Portman. I've always loved ballet from the time I was little. I wasn't very good. Um, and, um, you know, I never would have never would have been able to perform, but I loved ballet mm -hmm. and um, took classes and so went to see this movie, The Black Swan with Natalie Portman, and it wound up being a thriller and I heard it was, you know, a little bit scary, but I didn't, I didn't know exactly how scary it was going to be and so I was gripping the you know the seat with my white knuckles and the only way I could you know keep myself from um shooting out of there was to <laughs> envision in my mind oh that would be really cool if I you know could design a felt crown you know for a costume or uh you know just a costume in general and so I came home and um and started on that so um I think, you know, just a lot of times I will get ideas when I'm out and about um, nothing, nothing other than that movie, you know, did I, did I create like that, but um, I have created pieces, sculptural pieces um, from looking at pieces in nature. Um, and um, in fact, when I was in Australia, teaching a few years ago, um, I was with my friend Catherine O'Leary, who's also a, um, a wonderful felt maker. And so outside of her house, she had this paper bark tree. And I think, you know, maybe if you live in Australia, you kind of think of it as a nuisance tree because it has all of this spongy peeling bark. <laughs> but I loved that tree. And um, so when I came home, um, that was one of the things that I that I did was um, to recreate that tree out of felt with all of these different layers and um, I do that, you know, a lot if I'm, um, especially if I'm out of the country or in an area that I haven't been to, I'll mm -hmm. take, um, you know, one piece and uh, or one thing that I saw and come home and just try to make a memory piece mm -hmm. um, based on my travels. I think that that piece is on your website, right? Yes, uh huh, it is. Yeah, and I encourage you all the take other a look thing, at it. Oh, thank you. The other thing about that um, tree is that um, Catherine had me put my ear up to it, and you could actually hear water running. <laughs> Um, really running through the um through the tree it conducted must be there was either a high you know um water table or there was a stream or something but you could hear you could hear water running and so I of course had to come home and you know and make a memory piece based on that <laughs> uh, that I would do that too that's great <laughs> well um do you get your materials from a, a variety of places mm -hmm. and um including thrift shops, probably, you know, Goodwill and that kind of thing. So right here, we have an image of this piece on the, the cloth on the left you got from a thrift store. And then you, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming this is the hat. Right, yes. Um, so do you go out and try to find clothing at the thrift store to yes. kind of take care of the environment and reuse, recycle? Or that's just where you find the coolest stuff or both? <laughs> right. Um, the answer to that would be both. Um, I think it's great anytime that we're able to, to recycle. In fact, I was just looking at a picture earlier in the day, um, and I forget which country it was, but it was just a bunch of, you know, clothes that had been thrown away here in the U.S. and they were piled up, you know, in, um, <clears throat> in another country. And, you know, they were just talking about, you know, how much waste there is here. And so, um, of course, you, we should all be mindful of that. Um, but um, at the same time, I find some fabulous, um, you know, printed silks and beaded silks um, when I go to thrift stores. And I have noticed um, not so much this um, past year, but I think that's because people, you know, haven't been going to fancy, um, you know, 
events and so they've probably not been wearing these things and you know um you know getting rid of them but i've got quite a stash of um beaded um silk dresses and so i don't need any more really my husband would tell you that, <laughs> that i've got i've got plenty enough um and um so um i am able to source those items you know so much um you know, more reasonably than if I, you know, if I were to buy, um, you know, fabric that's already, already been made. And I think I get some, you know, really um, cool, you should see me when I'm in those thrift stores. It's like, <laughs> I'm a kid in a candy shop when I run across, you know, some of those. Well, I just, that's an amazing hat. I just love that hat. Well, thank you so much. You know, I was, I was looking through your website Mm -hmm. And I was, we just mentioned this while ago, was that I was seeing all the people that are in your classes. You have some great pictures from your classes. Oh, thank you. And it's like, what is it about a hat? Mm -hmm. It just, you know, you could just see people smiling so much because they were putting on these hats. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about if you go to a store and they have hats there, you try them on. Mm -hmm. We all do. You mm -hmm. may not buy a hat and wear a hat, but mm -hmm. there's something about hats what is right. that well it just makes us happy <laughs> it does and i think it's i think it's transformative um you know for me anyway putting a hat on and um you know and looking in a mirror it just it just changes you know kind of your whole um persona and it makes you feel makes you feel dressed up even if i'm just you know wearing a sun hat you know out in the yard i feel like i'm a little snazzier than if i you know if i weren't wearing one but i have always loved hats and i can recall um, my grandmother who was born in 1900 and so of course you know they went through the depression years and didn't have you know, didn't have um, many material things at all. And, you know, what they did have, you know, went to raise their, you know, their family. But I can remember, and I've got a beautiful picture of her wearing this, um, um, I, it was probably considered like a cartwheel hat with a, you know, big um, brim. And, um, and I just thought, you know, people used to, you know, even if they didn't have a lot, they would get, you know, dressed up. And, you know, and wear a hat. And, and I like to think that that, you know, that made her feel special, even at a time when, you know, when they didn't have much. And, um, you know, I can remember growing up and, um, you know, my dad would always get both my mom and myself a hat for Easter. And so I've got pictures of us wearing these hats and corsages that, you know, my dad bought, and it made me feel special. And so I think for me, there's, you know, a real emotional connection to, you know, to wearing hats. Um, I also love like the hats from the 20s and 30s, um, you know, and, and that era. Um, so I think, you know, in a, in a workshop setting, there are probably a lot of people who, you know, probably have, you know, kind of some of the same, um, you know, feelings that I do about hats. Well, speaking of feelings, do you put, I know on this one, there's a story behind this hat. Do you have meanings or association symbolism when in some of your works? Yes, um, I do. Um, in fact, I don't know if you can see this one. This is that conch shell hat that I've got um, back behind me. And so um, for that particular piece, um, my aunt Dot and Uncle James, they're both deceased now, but they used to go to Top Sail Beach in, I think it's North Carolina. Um, and so my uncle would fish and my aunt would collect shells. And so I've got the shell here. So this is the one of the shells that she gave me. Wow. And um, it's beautiful, isn't it? I just yeah. love it. Um, and so she used to give me some of those when, um, you know, when I would go to um, visit, um, she just had, you know, a huge collection. And so um, early, early on when I was, um, you know, just starting to make hats and I, ha I maybe had, you know, one hat block. Um, and I don't even think it was probably my, in my head size and I wasn't selling hats. So I just had this, you know, this one hat block. And um, so I was trying to think of some ways that maybe I could block hats 
without spending, you know, a lot of money. Wooden hat blocks can be kind of pricey. They're worth it, but, um, you know, but if you're on a budget. Um, so I was trying to think, um, wonder if I could use, you know, one of those conch shells to block a hat. And so, you know, I tr made a um, felt, um, you know, hood shape. And then I just, you know, blocked it and played with it for quite a long time to get that, you know, to get that shape. And um, sure enough, you can use a conch shell or, you know, or other things to block a hat. And so for me, that piece is special for a couple of reasons. It reminds me of, you know, of my, um, you know, aunt and uncle and their love of the beach. And, um, you know, it, um, reminds me that you can be creative and you don't have to spend a lot of money for, you know, for um, materials. And, um, you know, and also um, the one other thing about that, that was the first time that I won an award for, um, for one of my felt works. And um, so, so that was, you know, that was really special for me too. Um, so yeah, uh, and for a lot of pieces, there's, um, you know, there's some kind of an emotional um, connection to the piece. Well, this next image we have is another example of there's some meaning into the, the piece. Like the one on the left oh, it's, um, is the whole piece. And then mm -hmm. on the right is what it said in the middle. Can you talk mm -hmm. some about this piece? Yes. Um, so this was a piece that I did for um, originally for an exhibition with the um, Signature Gallery, the artist cooperative that I'm a part of. And I believe the theme for that was um, transformation. Um, and so, um, so when I was trying to think of um, you know, what I wanted to create, I just thought, you know, of a cocoon or, you know, a butterfly emerging, you know, from, um, from that would be a good theme. So this started out, you, um, I think I had it laid out on a um, table that was eight feet long and three feet wide. Um, so I had to, I had to do it in the summer and I had to do it outside because <laughs> I didn't have room to do it, um, you know, elsewhere. And, um, and so it's a hanging piece. And um, yeah, just, you know, just um, as with what it says, without the struggle, the butterfly would never fly. And I think, um, you know, that applies to our, you know, to our lives sometimes, you know, we may not like the struggle, um, you know, to get from, you know, point A to point B sometimes, but, um, but you know, it can be, um, you know, very beneficial. I also used this piece for um, Felt United. Um, I had mentioned that my friend Nicola Brown and I are the co-administrators for that. And the theme that we chose for this year um, was Emerge, um, you know, kind of a continuation of um, last year's theme, Confinement. And so I used this piece again for, um, you know, for that. I thought it was, you know, kind of timely for that. How big is this piece? Oh, it it actually didn't shrink a whole whole lot because of the amount of wool that I used in it. So um, more wool is less shrinkage, and um, less wool used in a process is more shrinkage. And so I it started out about eight feet in length, and so I think it ended up about maybe six feet in length. Wow. Um, so I did get shrinkage, um, but not as much as you might think <laughs> in the felting process. Oh, that's big. That's big. It, it is big. It was heavy when it was, you know, when it was wet too. So. I bet. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I always tell people in a, in a workshop, you get your workout, you know, when you're felting. So. <laughs> that's right. Well, one of the other things that I, that you make that I just love are the vessels that you make, mm -hmm. the containers, kind of like that was a big container. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So when you're making these beautiful vessels, mm -hmm. um, one, how did you go that route? And two, usually your theme is of nature, right? Yeah, well, I have a dog. Um, and so all of you who have dogs, you know, when you're out walking, uh, about half the walk is spent with the dog sniffing at things. <laughs> so, um, so yes, I I do make a lot of nature themed pieces, and um, I for, I forget who said this, but um, I had read at some point that you know 
um, nature is an artist and that really is true. I mean, you look at pine cones or lichen or mushrooms, you know, and all, all of those things, um, they really, if you look at them and examine them, they really are art um, in my mind. And so, um, you know, I'll just come home and I'll think, how could I recreate, you know, that in felt? And I, and so I love doing that. So I've got, I don't know if you can see this, but this is just one of the, um, the vessels. And so you can see I've got some lichen on here and, um, you know, just trying to kind of recreate, you know, those earthy, earthy feelings that, um, you know, that I see and, um, you know, feel on my walk, so. Well, you also teach echo printing, right? Mm -hmm. So how'd you get started in there? Well, let's see, that started, I believe it was 2012, it was the first time that I had been to Australia. And so I've taught a couple of times in Australia, but this particular time, the first time that I went, um, I was visiting my friend, um, I had mentioned her name um, a little while ago um, in helping me to, you know, come up with my, um, you know, possible questions that might come up in that um, jurying process. Um, but I went over to visit her the following year. And of course, Australia is just, you know, loaded with eucalyptus trees and um, so the leaves and the bark print. And so Joni um, had set up kind of a play date with um, her friend, Jillian Somerville Finch, who at the time was living in the patch, um, which is in Victoria. And so we went over for just a great day um, of eco printing. And so truly you can't go to a better place if you, if you want to you know, learn about um, eco printing. Um, one of the um, most well-known eco printers um, lives there. I've got her book here, actually. Oops. And so this book is by India Flint. And so if you're interested in, um, you know, in eco printing, this would be a, a good book to, you know, possibly pick up. It's called Eco Color. Um, and she, um, she's done extensive research on um, mm -hmm. eco printing. And um, so anyway, when I got home from, um, from Australia, I was just trying to play with different, um, you know, leaves that I have here. Um, so leaves that have a lot of tannin in them, like oak leaves, um, maple leaves, um, they typically are good printers. And so it's just been a lot of fun for me to, um, to experiment. And so if you don't know what eco printing is, it's just taking um, a substrate, you know, whether that's, you know, wool felt, which is what I typically use, I make either a bag or a hat, and then eco print that. So it's taking your substrate, and then, um, you know, layering with um, leaves, not all leaves print. So uh, again, you have to, you know, do a little experimentation and reading up on that. Um, and then bundling that really tightly and then either simmering it or um, steaming it. And, um, you know, when you open it up, it's kind of like opening a present because you never quite know what's going to be inside. So I just, I love the process. And so while I've been out walking my dog this week, I'm seeing some beautiful leaves that, you know, that have fallen from the trees. And so I'm, you know, gathering a collection. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love how you are able to, you know, echo print on a hat or the purses. Those were just beautiful. Those were yeah. And um, so I really, en I really enjoy the um, eco printing and, I just, um, for workshops, I just do it in generally in conjunction, you know, with the making of an item. And so wool, um, you know, felt um, just has a kind of a natural affinity for, you know, taking prints really well. So, okay. so it's, um, you know, it's a nice combination felting and eco printing. Huh. Well, most people, most artists, and most people, we have mm -hmm. aha moments in our lives. So have you had one, two, whatever aha moments, and would you share those with us? Mm -hmm. So 
Um, my biggest aha moment in felting, and it really has nothing to do with felting per se, but I would have to say, just say yes, even when you may be afraid to say yes, because um, long, long time ago when I, um, you know, was just starting to have some of my work out there and a dear friend of mine now, her name is um, Shirley Top, but at the time I did not know her. And so um, she just lived right down the road at the time. And she would just send me a little email every once in a while and say, um, would you teach a hat making class? And I would write back and I would say, oh, thank you so much for asking. I really like making hats, but I don't like talking in front of people. <laughs> So, um, you know, like giving speeches and public speaking, that just wasn't my thing. And um, so she would, you know, just write back and say, okay, but if you change your mind, you know, let me know. And um, so this went on for a while. And in the meantime, I'd had a few people ask the same thing, would you teach a class in hat making? And um, I knew some of them, some of them I didn't, but I just kind of kept a little list in case I ever got the nerve up to do that. <laughs> and so um, finally, I, I thought, well, I'll just do this one and, you know, get it over with and, um, and, you know, go back to my making. And so I rented a church basement, taught the class, came home, and I told my husband, I love teaching. It was um, it was totally different than standing in front of an audience and giving a speech, um, which would about make me break out in hives when I was in high school. Um, but it's just sharing what you love, um, sharing your passion. And so I think that has been my biggest aha um, moment. If I hadn't said yes to that. So um, Shirley, if you're watching, and I think you said you were going to thank you, thank you, thank you a million times, because I would have missed out on so much in in life. Um, before I began teaching, um, I'd never even had a passport. <laughs> you know, it used to be you could go to the Bahamas or Mexico with a driver's license and a birth certificate. Um, but I did not have one. And so um, my first international teaching was in um, Ireland. And that was, you know, when my friend Nicola asked if I would want to come over and stay with her and teach a hat making class. And, um, you know, so I did. And I've been to... Um, Chile and Northern Ireland, um, Australia. And, you know, the felt making, I, you know, I never ever could have guessed that, you know, it would have taken me to the places that I've been. I wouldn't have been able to go otherwise because my husband and I did just exactly what you're not supposed to do. And we paid for our son to, you know, go to college when we should have been saving up for retirement. So. <laughs> So um, it's just, you know, the felt making has just been a gift to me and the, um, the teaching has, you know, brought me so much joy meeting, you know, meeting other fiber artists and, um, you know, just really opening, you know, opening doors to the world to me. Yeah, it's interesting as you've talked today, because you, you talk about people as much as you've talked about your artwork. So mm -hmm. it's really clear how important they are to you mm -hmm. in those relationships. And, you know, me too. Good, good for you. Shirley, her name's Shirley, right? <laughs> yeah, Shirley. Yay, yeah. Shirley. What would we have done <laughs> if you hadn't done that? Thank you, Shirley. I know it. I know. Well, and I, and I do. I think, you know, I think I enjoy meeting and interacting with um, people. So that's been a real gift, you know, to me is just the people that I've met that I never would have come into contact with, you know, any other way. And I've also, um, throughout this felt making process, I've also hosted workshops, um, you know, for international felt makers. And so I, you know, had them actually come and stay at the house. And so that's, you know, it's been wonderful for me. I've been able to, you know, take them over to um, Lake Michigan and, you know, nobody, you just say, oh, I'm going to take you to Lake Michigan. And they think we're going to this little lake and you yeah. get there and it's, it's like a, it's like an ocean, except I always tell them it's like an ocean, but without the salt and nothing can eat you in there. Yeah. Yeah. 
So. Well, you have mentioned several times the nonprofit uh, Felt United mm -hmm. that you're very involved in. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about that and how you, you came to Felt United? Yes. Um, so Felt United was um, originally started by, um, again, my friend Alice Vermeulen, who I mentioned, um, you know, earlier as being a real mentor to, to me and someone who I really admired her work. And, um, and her friend, Cynthia Reynolds. So at the time, Alice was living in the Netherlands and Cynthia um, in Norway. And so they started Felt United and the mission is still the same. It's to unite felt makers around the world. Um, as with many arts, you know, a lot of times we're doing our work in isolation, we're by ourselves and we may not, you know, know another felt maker or another weaver or, you know, whatever. Um, you know, who lives nearby. And so, you know, through, um, you know, through their, um, you know, thinking, they thought, you know, this would be a really good um, thing to do. And it has been a wonderful thing. So on the first Saturday of October each year, um, you know, people from around the world, we all work around the same theme. So this year's theme was Emerge, um, but we've had a number of different things, you know, um, color themes and, um, you know, earth themes and, um, you know, just, just any number of things. Um, but everyone works around the same theme. And then, um, you know, around that, you know, first Saturday in October, people will post their photos on our Facebook group. And so it's, you know, it's all an internet based sharing. But, you know, I, I know there, you know, a lot of people find that there are drawbacks to the internet. For me, it has all been 100% positive and, um, and I love it. And, um, you know, again, I've just, you know, met some, you know, really dear friends. I consider them friends, whether, you know, whether I've met them or not. So um, it's, you know, it's just been a, a wonderful thing. It's, I forget, I think it was probably about maybe four or five years into Felt United, um, Alice and Cynthia decided that they were, you know, ready to move on to other things. And so um, Alice and I had become pretty good friends at that point. And she said, you know, would you be interested in, you know, continuing the tradition of Felt United? And um, so I thought, well, I loved it <laughs> um, anyway. And um, so, you know, I wasn't sure what it would entail, but um, I asked my friend Nicola in Ireland if she would, um, you know, be willing to, you know, partner partner with me on this, and she, you know, said absolutely. And so, you know, it's um, it's you know just a a way of felt makers uniting. Well, we we put the Facebook address in chat. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, thank you yeah. So much. If people want to, you might want to go look, check it out. And there's all kinds of images on there. And yeah. I guess we just missed. You know, yeah, but we'll the, be. Um, but you go out and get ready for next year. That's right? right. Yeah, Nicola and I usually announce the theme for you know for the year in the spring. So we take a couple of you know a couple of months off, and we just kind of brainstorm and come up with an idea, and um, then put it out there. And everyone has plenty of time to you know come up with um, with what they want to make for that year. And so this past year, um, well, two years. Um, there haven't been as many activities surrounding Felt United, but in years past there, you know, people would have um, exhibitions and, you know, fashion shows and, you know, that type of thing too. So um, it's really, you know, up to each individual artist how they want to celebrate the day or um, interpret the theme. And we're just, you know, always thrilled with, you know, what people come up with. All right, so what's next for you? What's next on the horizon for you? Well, I've I'm always making for one thing, and so I've got a I've got a few um, special orders, um, you know, that are in the works. The main thing for me right now is um, I've got to redo my website, which <laughs> I'm not much of a techie, but the platform that I use is outdated, and so it's not being supported anymore. So if I want to update anything, I've got to 
hop on that and get that done. If there's anyone out there who's techie, <laughs> um, contact me, please. Um, and then um, I also have a um, online um, hats workshop that's just getting ready to be released. Is it okay if I mention that? Let's see. I think Marie Spaulding, my friend from Livingfelt, just sent me a note just a little before I got on here. And she said, your new class goes on pre-sale Friday, November the 12th and live on Friday, November the 19th. So this is a brand new um, hat design um, with lots of um, resists and kind of cool elements, textural elements. So that'll be um, you know, coming up fairly soon. So that, that'll be again released through Living Felt. So Marie will have um, information posted about that. Now, is that open to anybody or do you need to have some experience or? Um, a little felting experience would be, would be beneficial. But if you don't have any and you're, um, you know, willing to, um, you know, just take it slow, it, it's, uh, Marie does a fabulous job of editing these um, videos. And, um, and so it's just like being in a regular workshop and in a, in a regular in-person workshop, um, I take beginners all the time and, you know, I'm always amazed at, you know, what people come up with. And so I, I really think that, you know, if you've just got even just a little bit of felting experience um, that um, anyone should be able to, um, you know, create a really cool hat. And so I, I've got um, one video that's already um, listed with them and that's for a um, simpler, just a cloche style hat. Um, and so that might be good maybe to do that one first and then, you know, then this one. But um, so that'll, that will be fun. Um, people, you know, interact online with those two. So I'll get questions, you know, once in a while, um, people asking for a little clarification. And I always like that. And I love seeing what people make. They send me photos. And <laughs> so that's always a lot of fun. Well, good. That's great. Yeah, and again, you heard it here first, folks. Textiles and Tea, we're on the cutting edge of what That's like right. Noon Thank and a half you. Ago. So <laughs> check out our website, and we'll show that website again, and it's in chat Thank um, you. if you want more information. Um, how about we take some questions? Great. From the audience? Okay. I'm going to take um, a little sip of my tea. Help yourself in that lovely mug. Um, what, what are the types of fleeces that you love the best for felting? Great question. Uh, thank you, Gail Valens. Right. So I use a lot of um, different types of wool and it's um, generally dependent on what I'm making. So if um, if I'm making something that's a wearable, like a hat, I usually use merino wool um, because it's, you know, it's so soft next to the skin. If I'm doing um, a vessel, um, I'll use, you know, um, wools that are um, you know, a higher micron count, a, a coarser because they'll, you know, hold their shape um, better. So I use um, MC1, I use um, Bergschaff, um, Thin, um, a variety, you know, a variety of different um, types of wool. And that actually um, brings up a, um, a good point because I had bought, I think, I, I think it was maybe when I was in the Netherlands, I bought um, a lot of this Bergschaff, and I'm probably not pronouncing that right. It's spelled um, B-E-R-G-S-C-H-A-F, and so I'm probably mispronouncing it, um, but I bought, I bought it, I brought it home, and um, and I hadn't used it before, but um, people had told me that they really loved using this wool. So I brought it home and trying to, you know, make a vessel or something. And I thought, oh, you know, this stays spongy. And I, you know, I, I just wasn't getting the um, finish that I wanted, but I bought so much of it. I thought, well, doggone it, you're going to have to persevere and figure out, you know, how to use this wool. And so, um, so I did. And so I found that it, um, it needed more um, soap, um, for one thing, than what I was, you know, used to using. And um, that, you know, you would work it for a while, 
and it stayed spongy, but then just all of a sudden, like, whoop, it, uh, you know, it, um, it really hardened. And um, so that was a good lesson again to me um, to, you know, not all wools are going to, you know, react to the same, um, you know, soap or the same pressure or the same, you know, time parameters. Um, you just, you know, um, you know, just have to experiment as with anything in life. And um, now it's one of my favorite wools to use. <laughs> Somebody else was asking about cheesecloth and mm -hmm. they were wondering on that large butterfly piece, the cocoon, mm -hmm. did you use cheesecloth on that? Yeah, I've got a, that, I always tell people, it, you know, in workshops where we're making vessels or, um, you know, pieces like that, that I use about everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> Um, in my pieces. So yes, it has cheesecloth and it also has um, mulberry bark in it. Um, and so a friend of mine from out of the country had sent me this big piece of lacy looking uh, mulberry bark. And I thought, well, I wonder if I could felt that in and sure enough, you can. So <laughs> do you use cheesecloth to um, when you're making wearable art? You can, yes, you, you can, can use that in, um, you can use it in Nuno felting. And I was just trying to, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I definitely, I use it in these um, vessels. I don't know if you can see like this area right here. Uh -huh. That's cheesecloth. I, yeah, I really like the effect that um, cheesecloth um, gives in felting. So yeah, you can, you can use it, um, for Nuno felting, any kind of an open weave, um, you know, natural, um, you know, fabric you can Nuno felt with, but you can also incorporate, you know, little bits and pieces of it in, you know, vessel making and um, a hodgepodge of things. <laughs> that was from Sue Sari. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a good question. This is from Deb Curtis. How do you make the vessels stiff and solid so they don't collapse in on themselves? Mm -hmm. So I don't use a stiffener with my vessels, but you but you can. There are stiffeners um, available. There are millinery stiffeners, and I don't use them myself um, because, like, I think this is you know it's it's pretty firm and. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't worry about it collapsing. It's felted well, um, but there are a number of stiffeners that you can use. And I believe um, if you go to the Living Felt um, website, I believe Marie did a um, comparison of different stiffeners and, you know, some that she, that she really likes. That's a, a really wonderful, um, site for felt makers because she has got all kinds of tips and um you know little free you know tutorials and every almost every wednesday she does a woolly wednesday program where you make something and it's just a lot of fun and she's such a patient um you know person um people people love her including me so um that's a, a really good site but i'm sure she's got a um, a YouTube, um, you know, clip with, um, with that segment that was on Wooly Wednesday, um, comparing different, um, stiffeners. I've seen that on that Wooly Wednesday on Facebook. I didn't know what it was. Now it's, I do. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. You should watch one. So she, yeah. she does some, um, some of them are, um, little needle felted projects. Some of them are wet felted projects. Um, and yeah, she, you know, you usually completes it, you know, within the hour long time segment. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> I tell her, I, I like to just tune in sometime just, to, you know, especially in the winter time here and it's, you know, cold and gloomy and I like to watch and she's just always got a smile on her face and she's such a, a fun, sweet person. So, um, great resource for felt makers. Oh, 
Oops, I think you're on mute, Kathy. I am. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know if you can hear. My dog is having a hissy fit. Oh, yeah. So I, I don't know my... if you can hear or not, but I keep hitting mute. Oh, and no. I, the I, I told my husband, take something. our dog out for a long walk. So. <laughs> the joys of working from home. Yeah. But anyway, I've just put Wooly Wednesday in yep. Uh, chat. Yep. And if so, if somebody Googles Wooly Wednesday, they'll find it, right? Yeah. So okay. it's... Um, there you go, Harriet. Yeah, oh. Wooly Wednesday, and it's through Living Felt. Um, so if you if you just type that in, you'll you'll come up with it. And it's on Facebook also. So, all right, all right. Um, one more question, and then um, I'll let you go. Gosh, this has gone <laughs> by think, really quickly. <laughs> I know, isn't it amazing? Do you think felting has changed a lot since you first started? I mean, I I learned felting a few years ago, but it seems mm -hmm. like every class I take. They're like, oh, do this now. We do it this way. Has it changed much or? Well, I think, um, you know, as you probably know, you know, felt making is the oldest known textile to humankind. It, you know, it was probably discovered, you know, there are a lot of different, you know, stories surrounding how it may have started, but more than likely in my mind, it was quite by accident, you know, some wool is on the ground it rains, people walk on it, and voila, you've got, you know, a piece of felt, and it may not be beautiful felt, but, um, but you know, it was functional, and it, you know, probably served people's needs um, as far as, you know, clothing and um, shelter, um, yurts, and that type of thing. Um, so that's one thing that I love about felt making, um, is that, that connection to, um, the roots of, you know, felt making, how it can be just very simple. And of course, there are ways to, you know, speed that process up. There are, you know, certainly ways of, you know, making beautiful felt. But I love the fact that, um, like, you know, sometimes if I'm teaching, I'm staying in a hotel. Um, I've got, of course, I've got wool in my suitcase and a little bubble wrap and there's shampoo in the shower at the hotel. And so, you know, I can, I make something. <laughs> so I can see um, in the bathroom on the airplane. I do. I have water. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I've got everything that I need. So, um, so it's, it's great. But I, you know, I love that. And of course, you know, there are just um, immeasurable, um, you know, felting techniques and, um, you know, I could, you know, I could try to make something different every single day, and I wouldn't be able to accomplish it all in my lifetime. But, um, but I think one of my um, favorite things about felt making is the um, inherent simplicity and, you know, the connection that we have to our, um, you know, ancestors um, who have done this, you know, for, you know, thousands and thousands and, you know, thousands of years. And actually, um, even though um, I think, you know, the felt, you know, in the here and now is gorgeous, you can look at um, felts um, at the Hermitage Museum, and you can look that up online. And I'll tell you some of the felts that, you know, that have been found in the, you know, in the, um, you know, frozen burial grounds, they look like something that you could see in a museum now. Um, there's a horseman's blanket and a swan. And they're just, you know, they're just gorgeous. Um, I recommend that people take a look at that um, if they're interested, especially in the history of um, felt making and, you know, seeing some, you know, very, very old, but um, just very intricate and beautiful and long lasting. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, felts. And so, um, again, that's, you know, one of the things that I love is the connection, um, you know, to our, um, you know, felt history. Well, I can't believe it. It's time to quit. Um, we do have um, Gigi Dan wants to know um, if we can get a list of the artists, but I think a lot of the artists you've mentioned are on your website, right? Yeah, um, probably, but, I, but I'd but i be happy to, um, if she wants to send me a message or if you want me to send it to you, I'd be happy to, um, to give you um, some of those those names, I'm always happy to promote other um, felt makers and other artists in general. I think it's you know so important that um, you know that we just build each other up. And I guess that's you know my 
my other aha moment is just um, surround yourself with really good people. Um, I found such wonderful sharing, um, giving people throughout my, um, you know, felt making journey. And um, so thank you to, you know, to everyone who's, you know, brought me to where I am today. Gigi will get that to you. Okay. <laughs> there are, um, we do need to stop for the day. I'm sorry to say, oh, God. But I do want to say that, um, Dawn's website, go to her website. There's a lot of information there. Um, and, and I know she's listed some of the um, people that she's mentioned today. Um, but if you want uh, more of those, email me. I'm at advertising at weavespandi.org and we'll get you that list of the folks she's mentioned today. Thank you so much, Dawn. You've Thank you today. so much. Uh, again, her website is feltsoulright.com. And she has beautiful work on there, lots of information. So go check that out if you can. Um, I do want to say thank you to the Michigan League of Handweavers, um, part of Dawn's fan club. They love her, <laughs> but we know why. I love them too, so thank <laughs> you. <laughs> this wonderful guild, I was looking on their website, this wonderful guild um, has had a conference and I may have this wrong, but I think since 1959, that and they right. lay claim to the fact that they are the first to have done a national uh, fiber conference. They do great a great website, job. lots yeah. of history. Um, they have some Zoom classes. If you're looking for a Zoom class, I think um, uh, Karen Dondi is next up for them. So go check it out if you're looking for a, a Zoom class. And thank you so much, Michigan League. We appreciate it. Um, go to their website, mlhguild.org. That stands for Michigan League of Handweavers, guild.org. And uh, go see what they have to offer. Um, if you would like to sponsor or your guild or your business, uh, please go to our website. There's lots of information there at weavespindye.org on how you too can be a sponsor for textile and tea. And we can keep this going. Um, we also get a lot of support from the Fiber Trust. Uh, if you would like to see more programming like this or Spinning and Weaving Week we had a couple of weeks ago, we got some great stuff coming up this spring. Um, please donate or join or both. And you can do those online at weavespindie.org. Don't forget, Convergence Registration's open. Got some classes. Got some felting class, as a matter of fact. Um, we will um, be sure you go check it out. Some of the classes are starting to fill up, so jump in there and get, uh, get signed up for the class that you'd like to take. Um, if you've missed an episode or you want to watch this again today, share it with a friend. Um, you can do that at Facebook. You do not have to have a Facebook account. I can never say that enough. You can just go in and watch the videos anytime you want. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Dawn. It's thank been you. a lovely afternoon. We look forward to seeing you next week when we have Bhakti Zeke going to be on here. If you're not familiar with her work, look her up. She's incredible. Thank you again. Y'all have a wonderful week and happy tea.